Hi, I'm Pastor Dennis Plant. I'm the principal of Vision Colleges, the best Bible college on or off the internet. But don't take my word for it. Go for yourself to have a look. Have a look at our new website, Internet Bible College. Dot com. There you're going to find the most flexible, affordable, dynamic set of biblical studies that you can find anywhere. Whether you want to simply study a subject or if you want to earn a degree, if you're a new Christian wanting to find your way or idle curiosity, whether you're looking for professional development, you need look no further than internetbiblecollege.com. And there are no huge fees. We're most affordable and yet most legitimate. Have a look for yourself. Internet Bible College. Dot com. But right now, what I'm interested in doing is sharing with you is one of our subjects, The World's Greatest Story by Dr. Ken Chant. He's the founder of Vision Colleges. And this particular study is about the church history. Oh, I can see your eyes rolling already. Church history, who needs it? Well, actually, we all need church history because it's vital to our understanding of who we are, where we came from and where we're going to go and how we can better understand the world around us and how we can influence it. The story of church history is the most fascinating that you can come across. Consider this. In a world that was full of pagan religions and different kinds of cultures that have been in existence for thousands of years. Christianity steps into this with 12 men and a few others anointed of the Holy Spirit and within 20 centuries has become the world's biggest religion. Influenced more people, influenced more cultures and societies and has done far more good than we can possibly imagine or encounter and it's had its fair share of problems it's been fraught with rogues and heroes and there's a very colorful story when you start dealing with the church and we need to understand the whole of it the problem is that the church is broken up into four different eras and the problem is that we, we don't really get to understand a great deal of the, of the church without understanding about these four eras. Let's have a look at them. These are the four major periods in church history. The first millennium up to the 11th century, the Middle Ages, the Reformation and the modern church. Sadly, a lot of church history tends to build around the second, third and fourth period. But we're going to be looking at the first period, the first millennium, because really that's where the most fascinating part of church history can be found. It's all fascinating and it all teaches us. But those first thousand years have such stories to tell that they'll enthrall you. We need to realize that that's, uh, the adventures of the early, early church ran the gamut of human experience, rising and falling between lofty nobility and squalid ignominy. Here we can see people collapsing from the grandeur into disgrace, rising from the basest of cowardice to incredible bravery. Here we can find chronicles of love and hate, laughter and tears, triumph and defeat, vice, virtue, greed, generosity, failure and success. The finest and the foulest of human behavior lies in the annals of the church. But in the end, love and grace prevail. Christ gains honor from his people and the word of the apostle comes true, which is unto God be glory in the church and in Christ throughout every generation and forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3.21 it's a great statement, it's a wonderful fulfillment, but it still brings us to a question of why should I bother studying church history itself? Well, here's some good reasons why you and I should study church history. Bill Vasilakis is the uh, uh, president of the uh, CRC churches. He makes several quite, quite astonishing points as far as understanding church history is concerned. He says, first of all, it's fascinating. The story that's exciting in its own right with endless action, incredible exploits, marvellous heroes, unspeakable villains, and all the drama and excitement that indeed make truth stranger than fiction. 
He also points out it's satisfying, it fulfills something. That is our need to understand our own origins and what therefore the present means that our destination should be choose to journey towards tomorrow. Indeed, can anyone have a true sense of where they're going if they don't know where they came from? It provides knowledge, the doctrines that are now widely believed by churches throughout the world are developed as much in history as they are in theology and in the development of the church. It's all a part of bringing to us a picture of who God is and what he is. It brings strength. Knowing church history helps us to hang on sometimes. You know, how terrible and dreadful were many of the enemies of Christ towards the Christians. The issues that they faced as they set themselves to fulfill the Great Commission. Yet they overcame even the most dreadful and most awful barriers of hatred. Christianity finally became the only lawful religion in the Roman Empire. Seeing how the church overcame such impossible obstacles in previous centuries should surely help us to understand what we can go through today. The issues we face pale to insignificance to some of the issues that were faced by the early church. It creates sympathy. Knowing the facts of our past, we can better understand the problems confronting the church today. And we need to understand that, because the issues we face today very often are mirrored in our past. It imposes a, a sense of responsibility, gazing at the heroism, seeing the tears, the toil, the trembling, the bloodshed and the anguish that preceded us. We owe those who made it possible for us to worship and very often paid the ultimate price to do so. It brings instruction, the successes and failures of the past provide examples for our guidance today. We can learn from our forefathers. We can be the beneficiaries of their triumphs. We bear all, we bear the burden of their defeat. The story shows us how to serve God better how to crush Satan utterly. But if we don't know, how can we learn? How can we gain the benefit that was intended for each and every one of us? The issues facing the church in the first century, if it was going to grow, were insurmountable in today's thinking. I doubt that today we would have the courage, the strength and the fortitude without knowledge of history to be able to stand as firm as our forefathers did. The church was born not into a good time. It was born into an age of religion, an age of terror. They were hard times, to say the least. And yet the church was to bring with it the most gentle, the most loving, the most dynamic, the most powerful, the most miraculous, the most wondrous stories and issues that you could possibly imagine. But those very early days of the church it was a very obscure time for the church and the obscurity of the church was a huge barrier to its growth as we will see in just a second or two. Consider this, that the church was born on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem of Judea, a backwater of the Roman Empire which itself occupied just a small part of the earth's surface. It represented only one corner of civilization. Contemporary with Rome were other more ancient and still flourishing cultures. To the immediate east was the populous and powerful empire of the Parthians, an implacable enemy of Rome. South lay India, whose opulence and antiquity had astonished Alexandria the Great uh, just four centuries earlier. Further east was the immense and yet more ancient lands of China, Japan and other peoples of the Orient. Their civilizations were in no way inferior to Rome. Their luxury and grandeur surpassed even that of the Caesars. Then there were the barbarian hordes in northern Europe, Africa and the Americas. The vast stretches of the Asian plateaus, our history books, including the Old Testament, may be engrossed with Rome, but in its own day it was one of but several empires 
and not perhaps even the greatest of them. We tend to overlook that fact so easily. And had you been a visitor from outer space, wondering which of these religions was going to prevail over the centuries, you may well have chosen Prince Guatemala, the Buddha, whose religion is, was now seven centuries old, many millions of followers. You might have turned to a still more ancient philosophies of Confucius or Lao Tse or the thousand the thousand-year-old faith of the prophet Zarathustra, which had millions of followers scattered throughout Persia, the Middle East, Egypt, and even among the Romans. It would have seemed improbable that this little company of Christians gathering in the Judean corner of the empire could become one of the world's greatest religions. It would have, it would have seemed impossible. And especially when you take time to consider its most un, uh, uncompromising beginning, unpromising beginning. The contemporary observer outside that little group of disciples of Jesus would have thought it's impossible that within a five centuries it would outstrip its compet competitors for the religious allegiance of the Roman Empire and become the professed faith of the rulers and the overwhelming majority of that realm. Still less would have dreamed that within less than 2,000 years it would become worldwide with more expansive geographic spread and a greater influence on mankind than any other religion. And yet it is the truth that from, from humble obscurity Christianity rose to become the largest religion on the face of the earth and indeed the most influential of them all. The second great barrier that the church had to overcome was the barrier of religions. There were three groups of religions of the day one might consider. One was the ancient pagan religions, there was the Judaic religion, and there was the mystical religions, all of which came together uh, to form an opposition against uh, Christianity itself. Of course, we need to realize that religion of its day was rather different to religion as it was back in the days of Jesus and of the disciples. And it's hard for us to imagine the depth to which religion penetrated Greek and Roman society in particular. Myths and legends prevailed over the lives, culture and structure of the people. They, they, long before the church was born, Greek and Roman mythology had fused to become a homogenous group of deities. They formed a very strange set of religion that was used not so much to bring people to any sense of God or worth of life, but religion was used in the day to control people. That was the very purpose of religion, just to control people, and it was very good at doing that. It was the glue of their society of the day. Was Christianity brought a very different idea, a very different set of philosophies from that which was prevailing in the early Roman lifestyle. The worship of pagan gods was established in the Greco-Roman world and it was interwoven into every fabric of society. You know, just to give you an example, before you left the house you had to uh, offer make offerings to three different deities, one deity to open the door, another deity to cross the threshold, another deity to close the door behind you. Every meal had, and every event of society was infused with different kind of libations and prayers and offerings. People were religious of the day, but the religion of the day was very, very different to the religion of Christianity into a world of religious control came Christianity, a religion based upon divine revelation, wars against the prevailing culture of debate and philosophical, philosophical speculation. It mocks the pretensions of glory of the Greek civilization. And yet, this is what Christianity did. It came and cut across the whole of that prevailing sense of religion of the day. And then there was the prevailing Judaism, which for 20 generations had been the prevailing religion for the Jews. By the time of Jesus, it had indeed broken the boundaries of Israel. But Judaism had, had, had broken out of the boundaries of Palestine. It became widely spread and honored. 
The Jews alone were legally permitted to claim that their God was the sole God and to ignore state religions of Rome. The Jews had gained this exemption as a result of, in, of submission to secular rule of foreign powers but never to accept the desecration of their religion. So when Jesus comes on the scene and challenges the whole of Judaism it's easy to begin understanding why Judaism fought against the things that Jesus was saying. The Jews had found a way to live and to prosper in the society of their day and Jesus comes and he throws a blanket over all of that. And those that followed Jesus were indeed passionate about their faith and not willing to surrender the ideals of, of their Christianity. They were not prepared to surrender anything. They were not prepared to surrender their faith to anything. No lions, no crucifixion, no tortures, no beatings, no imprisonment, no banishment, nothing would stop the Christian who would gladly give up his life in the belief that he would take it back again. Do we really have that kind of faith today where we would willingly give up our life in the sure expectation that we would take it again? This was something the Jew could not comprehend. It was something the ancient pagan religions could not comprehend. Josephus writes this astonishing piece. He said that they contemn the miseries of life. They are above pain by the generosity of their mind. And as for death, it will be for their glory. They esteem it better than living always. And indeed, our war with the Romans gave abundant evidences of what great souls they had in their trials wherein, although they were tortured and distorted, burnt and torn to pieces, went through all kinds of instruments of torment, that they might be forced either to blaspheme the legislator or to eat what was forbidden of them. Yet they could not be made to do either. No, nor once to flatter their tormentors, nor to shed a tear, but they smiled into their very pains and laughed at those to scorn who inflicted torments upon them and resigned up their souls with greater clarity as expecting to receive them again. We need to understand that the Jews, the Christians of the day, had an incredible sense of purpose an incredible sense of purpose that somehow seems to have waned and waxed over the centuries and has become today just a shadow of the faith that it was in the days of the apostles. Indeed, if you'd be an observer of the day and you'd asked which would triumph, the established Jewish faith or the new and heretical Christian sect that had sprung up, the answer would have seemed obvious, the Jews will prevail. But the Christians, like many other splinter groups, would certainly perish and soon be forgotten. And yet, 2,000 years later, Christianity is still the largest religion on the face of this planet. The next great barrier that the church had to overcome were the mystery cults. The ancient religions of the Greco-Roman world were practiced by community rather than by individuals. The new cults were highly personalized. Against the impersonal civic character of the state religion, the mystery cults offered a very personal salvation based on an encounter with a divine power. This direct appeal to the individual with a promise of a changed life, an offer of immortality, a hope of a glorious destiny, made the new cults immensely alluring to many people and they paralleled the claims of the church in many different ways. And just here's some, just some examples for us just to consider as we look at these things. So, the baptism, sometimes by immersion, sometimes by sprinkling using water, blood or wine. Love feasts and other sacred meals that had many of the characteristics of the early Christian celebrations of the Eucharist. The use of blood to remove sin, sometimes by full immersion in the blood of a slaughtered bullock and the like. A belief in a hero god who died and rose again. The idea is expressed in many forms of the Greek and Roman myths. Belief that initiates could share the resurrection and immortality of their god and that the obedient would gain heavenly reward. 
an expectation of miracles amongst those who became fully initiated into the cult or obedient to its mandates. An, equi an equality of status among full initiates that removed the high social barriers of the larger world. These were the mystery cults that the church had to contend with at the time. And indeed, on surface, it would seem that Christianity was little more than a mystery cult itself. So was, was the church a mystery cult of the day? Well, not at all. The church stood absolutely apart from those cults in one particular, or should I say one person, Jesus. And contrary to the mythical deities and legendary events upon which the cults were based, Jesus was a real man. His life, his death, his resurrection were recorded in facts. They were not lost in the mist of time or iniquity, especially of the day, but had verifiably occurred within the lifetime of the first hearers of the gospel. So there was no question about that. But beyond that, of course, the character of Jesus was unsurpassed, full of grace and dignity, and like the bizarre and often scandalous behavior of the cultic heroes. But above all, there was his teaching, which carried into every word a ring of truth that showed itself instantly powerful in all who believed in him. In another way also, the church should depart from the mystery cults. Its open invitation to all who wanted eternal life, simply to embrace the gospel. The mystery of the cults was so called because their practices were mysterious. Their doctrines revealed only to a small and privileged a group of full initiates. So despite their bur burgeoning popularity, their seemingly inevitable triumph, the mystery cults were steadily overtaken and surpassed by the gospel, whose teachings were open and available for all, and many of them eventually vanished altogether as the church gained supremacy through the empire. It might seem surprised to us today, but the church faced incredible amounts of cultural opposition, especially that because like many of its competitors, it did not seek to conform to the surrounding culture. In contrast with all previous world conquerors, the Romans were a tolerant people. So long as the people respected Roman authority, no pressure was put on them to adopt Roman culture or religion. The effect of the Roman rule was to encourage it cheerful syncretism where a place was found for every cult and the various deities of the conquered peoples were identified with each other just as the Greek Zeus was reckoned as the same as the Roman Jove. Well you might say of course well hang on what about later on? Well later the Roman uh, emperors of course did take a slightly different point of view and insisted that they should be deemed at, uh, recognized as the absolute deity. But the, 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 the Roman culture that the church was born into was just a little bit different to that. Attempts were made to find common thread in all religions so that everyone could live together harmoniously. However, into this there were problems because in every festival, sporting event, theatre performance, civic performance, holy days, they were all intertwined with prayers, libations and sacred ceremonies of every kind. And into this, of course, the church had a problem because they refused to acknowledge anyone but Christ as Lord. And they refused to acknowledge any other God. Those attitudes to a contemporary watcher would have seemed likely to endear the church to the mass of citizens. On the contrary, it would have seemed like Christians had deliberately chosen a policy guaranteed to lock them into significance, insignificance yeah. and irrelevance. We need to understand that the church of Jesus Christ in that early day has risen up against society and this is going to be the nub of its issues with the world of the day. Of course, against all of that, there was another barrier, and that is the barrier of misunderstanding. It was the cross that the highest religion and best government the world had known to that time conspired in hatred to kill Christ. Jew and Roman joined hands to murder the one who came from God to save them both. It was a microcosm of the history of the church. Sadly, Across the centuries, not just the worst of men have persecuted the church, but also the best. 
some of the finest of earth's rulers have risen up in hatred against Christianity and striven to destroy it. There's a notable example seen in the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, a Stoic philosopher. He reigned from 161 to 181 and under his rule Justin Martyr, Polycarp, Pothinus and many others were put to death. They were reckoned to have committed treason against the state. Marcus himself endeavoured to be impartially sanctioned of the prosecution, but some of the provincial governors were motivated by avarice, fear, and were more violent than the emperor would have readily allowed. It's an interesting thing, though, to read about Marcus Aurelius. Today, he's known mostly for his remarkable diary called The Meditations, which was found after his death. It wasn't written for other people. It was really written for himself. But there's a series of quotes here to give us an insight into Marcus Aurelius. Have a look at these thoughts from Marcus Aurelius. A man should be upright, not be kept upright. Never esteem anything as of advantage that you will make you break your word or lose your self-respect. How much time he gains who does not look to see what his neighbour says or does or thinks, but only at what he does to himself, to make it just and holy. Love the little trade which you have learned and be content with it. There is a proper dignity and proportion to be observed in the performance of every act of life. A good man makes no noise over a good deed, but passes on to another as a vine to bear grapes again in season. It is a man's peculiar duty to love even those who wrong him. It is a curious set of statements. One has to wonder how someone who could write such things should so completely misunderstand the church and think it necessary to obliterate Christian faith. That very nobility and temperate austerity made him look with antagonism upon the zealous and destructive church. At the time he was waging war on the frontiers of the empire, defending it against the barbarian onslaughts, and Christians seemed to him to be a turbulent fanatics who were a menace to society and the security of the state. And yet later, of course, they were the same ones who were to reinforce the state much later, four or five hundred years later. But Marcus Aurelius was a persecutor of the church and like many great leaders down through the centuries has been a man who persecuted the church because he didn't understand what he was dealing with. Under his authority two main bursts of persecutions brought the violent death of two great Christian leaders Polycarp in 166 and Bishop Pontius of Lyons in 177 and an unknown, countless number of others, men, women, young people, who all perished miserably under the hand of this dreadful person. It's been sadly true throughout the long history of the church that just as many fine people have scorned its message as have the wicked. The good news of God's free grace offered to the worst of us, to the crucified one, the miracle of resurrection and ascension, the promise of his return, the ascension of resurrection from the dead, all have often seemed impossible, if not scandalous, even to people of goodwill. So the preaching of the church has been misunderstood, her motives misrepresented, her methods misconstrued, and her mission misinterpreted, and has been that way down through the centuries. And so down through the centuries, of course, the church, like her Lord, has been crucified, but if the church shares, shares in the dying of Christ, she also shares in his resurrection. And that has proven as indestructible as he is. In the end, that is our only true victory. Not that we transform the face of society, but that great lever of all, godly and ungodly alike, has no lasting victory over the church of Jesus Christ. When we stop and take time to consider all that has happened down through the centuries, we see the persecution, the misunderstanding, all those things that have so hurt us, over which we, the church has risen and proven itself, one particular verse comes to mind. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And how true that has proven to be. 
The history of the church is a fascinating history. The great barriers that it had to overcome, it indeed overcame. And you know, that gives us something to rejoice over because you see, if the church could overcome those great and terrible barriers down through the centre, then it should indeed give us hope that we too can overcome. We've been studying the world's greatest story. I'll just want to say, I, I can only scratch the surface. There's so much more that you need to know. And I want to encourage you to get hold of the book, World's Greatest Story, from Vision Colleges of the InternetBibleCollege.com. There you can find the whole thing. Why, why do we take so much time to bring these things? Because, as we have said to you so many times before, we tell you these things because you matter. You matter so much that God sent his only begotten son into the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 2,000 years of misunderstanding, martyrdom, triumph, failure, 2,000 years of history have not been able to stop the church. It's been persecuted, it's been banned, the Bible's been burnt and buried, but yet they still rise up. Nothing has been challenged nor proven as much as the Church of Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, have a look at the past and understand that we have a wonderful future. Till next time, I'm Pastor Dennis Plant with Vision Colleges. The Lord bless you. Real good.